will be live streaming all night. Last month, we had over 9,300 people between Washington, D.C. and Nevada. So we're getting a large audience. Welcome to Timelines, episode 265. This is a special edition, a live presentation of Jim Owens speaking to the RMC at the Atlantis Casino. In this version, Jim will lay out cowboy ethics, the code to live by. Without further ado, let's get right into this episode of Timelines. Robert, thank you. I'm, uh, I'm honored and uh, delighted to be here. My talk tonight is called Standing Tall in an Upside Down World. For the past 10 years, I've been writing and speaking about the American cowboy. And I'm often asked, why cowboys? Why not astronauts or Major League Baseball players or maybe even Wall Street executives? What's so special about cowboys? Well, maybe it's a generational thing, but cowboys were my childhood heroes. And I think back to the countless Western movies I saw at the Saturday matinee. To me, the cowboy seemed larger than life. He was someone you could always count on, no matter what. And I can remember like it was yesterday, those good guys in the white hats who always stood up for what was right and how they made me want to do better and be better than I was. So cowboys were my childhood heroes, and I've come to realize many, many years later, they're still my heroes today. But the figure who inspires me now isn't the cowboy of the silver screen. It's the real life working cowboy and cowgirl. The one who's out mending fences in blazing heat, who saddles up in a blinding snowstorm to rescue a stranded calf. An iconic figure who I believe represents the best of America, the courage, the honor, and the plain hard work that built this great country of ours. My hope is that the heroic figure of the cowboy and cowgirl will inspire you as he has inspired me to reach for the best in yourself so that you can succeed in both your career and in life. First of all, the way cowboys and cowgirls live their lives raises the question, what does success really mean? Our society has been shaped by a unspoken yet very powerful assumption that success means money and all the things that money can buy. It's so easy to get caught up in all that and spend our whole lives striving for the bigger house, the nicer car, the, fan the, the bigger job. At a time when mainstream American culture is so fixated on material success, cowboys and cowgirls remind us that the best things in life really aren't things at all. They find their rewards in the simple, rugged way of life they've chosen for themselves. Being out in the open air, 
living close to the animals, in tune with the rhythms of nature. As many studies show, beyond a basic comfort level, more money doesn't make people happier. Happiness has much more to do with the joys of family and friends. In doing work, we find to be meaningful, regardless of the status or paycheck attached. Cowboys teach us the same lesson, but they do it by touching our hearts because they live their values. That's why there's such a powerful source of inspiration. They encourage us to rethink how we measure success based on where we each find meaning in our own lives. But there's more to it than that. At a time when it can feel like the whole world is going downhill and the old rules no longer apply, cowboys and cowgirls point us back to basics, back to fundamental principles of right and wrong, back to the idea that success isn't a matter of your job title, your lifestyle, or your bank account. True success means you've earned the respect, the trust, and the admiration of those who know you best your friends, your family, your colleagues, your clients. In short, even if the world around you is going crazy and things seem completely upside down, you are standing tall. And here's the good news. This is something we can all achieve. You don't have to have a big job or a big paycheck or a big house to be respected and admired by those who know you best. But it does take some thought and effort. If every day you nurture and develop the four traits that are the foundation of personal character, it starts with a positive attitude, which to me means a can-do spirit, one that's fueled by believing in yourself, coupled with the recognition that you, and only you, are the author of your own life story. Just imagine how much will, how much drive in sheer optimism it took to settle the West. Even today, cowboys and cowgirls face so many tough jobs that they didn't, if they didn't have a can-do spirit, they would never get out of bed in the market in the morning. Think of your own experiences in school and in the workplace. If someone has an attitude of whatever, or hey, it's, my, it's not my job, their abilities won't take them very far. By the same token, someone may lack skills or experience, but with the right mindset, they can be constantly learning and moving forward. Any good teacher, any business owner will tell you that attitude trumps ability every single time. 
Does anyone here know someone who has a bad attitude and has succeeded anyway? I see you're looking at your neighbor over here. That's not, not, don't, don't do that. I can honestly say I don't. The, the second character trait we all need is integrity. We live in a complicated world, and things don't always seem black and white. But on a personal level, integrity is pretty simple. It means you choose to do the right thing, even when it's hard and there's no clear payoff. To some people, integrity means nothing more than following the rules. But I disagree, because you can always bend rules or simply go around them. To me, integrity has more to do with that inner voice that tells you the difference between right and wrong. A voice that can only come from within. If we can learn anything from the cowboy, it's that everyone needs a code, a creed to live by. All of us. Doesn't matter how strong somebody is, doesn't, ma doesn't matter how well intentioned some somebody might be. We all need a solid belief system a moral compass, a north star, if you will, to guide us when the temptations are huge or the prevailing culture goes against what we know in our hearts is the right thing to do. Even today, cowboys and cowgirls still live by their code the code of the West. In fact, honoring the code is the hallmark of a genuine cowboy. It's the glue that binds cowboys into a brotherhood. Now at this point, some of you all might be asking yourself, was there really a code of the West? Or was this something dreamed up by a Hollywood writer. I know we're in, this is kind of cowboy country, but I want to show of hands. It's not going to hurt my feelings. How many of you are thinking, yep, there really was a code of the West? And how many of you are thinking, Jim, my friend, you've seen one too many Western movies? Come on, show of hands. Code of the West, yes. Okay. Well, I promise you, the code of the West is for real. And it was the product of a unique place and time. In the days of the open range, while the West was still being settled, there was no system of courts and laws. So if you had a dispute with a neighbor, the sheriff might literally be 500 miles away. So you had to have some way, some set of behavior that, we, that they could all agree upon. So the cowboy code was the only civilizing authority. And the so-called rules really weren't rules at all. They were more about character and the principles you live by, even when no one was looking. This is not a history lesson. This is not about nostalgia. And no one's trying to turn back the clock 150 years. The code of the West couldn't be more relevant to our lives today because it's a reminder of timeless, universal principles that apply to each of us 
no matter who we are or what we do. That's why I wrote the book, I cannot believe it's been 12 years, called Cowboy Ethics. I was convinced we needed a new way of thinking about business ethics because the old legalistic by the rule book approach never works. There's always another loophole, another way to game the system. Cowboy ethics points us to a different model, one that's based not on rules, but on principles. You can always bend rules, you can't bend principles. In my book, I translated the unwritten Code of the West into a set of 10 principles that all Americans can share. A set of values that we all have in common. I want to refer you all. Do you all have this little card? If you don't raise your hand, we'll try to get one to you. Everyone should have a little card like this. Anybody that doesn't, doesn't have one? Anybody? On the front is this, I still get chills when I see this picture. This is called Hero of the Storm. This was taken by David Stecklin and I, up in Sun Valley, Idaho. I said, David, how cold was this? He said, Jim, I don't, I don't have no idea. It, but it, this was taken in Montana in the, in the middle of winter. Could have been 10 or 20 below zero. Well, this, is, this image continues to almost haunt me every time I see it. And I first saw this uh, probably 15 years ago. And I want to ask you all to turn over to the back. Now, I said the Code of the West was never written down. But somebody in this audience is going to say, Jim, I'm going to break some bad news to you. Some guy named Zane Gray wrote a book, which I read back in high school, called Code of the West. Sure, I read it three or four times. He never said what was in the code. He just said, cowboys lived by a code. And I said, I'm going to figure this thing out. And it took me probably six to nine months of talking to ranchers and some cowboys. And I easily read 100 Western books. I love to read. And I watched, I don't know, 25 of the classic Western movies, Lonesome Dove, Red River. I've seen them all. So this is, this is my take on the Code of the West. Before I go through this, and a few of you all might be aware of this, or maybe not. In, 20, in 2009, I did a documentary. We won two very nice awards for this called Code of the West, Alive and Well in Wyoming. And we had the uh, opening, if you will, uh, in Laramie. And I thought maybe we'd get 30 or 40 people. I didn't know. We got 300 people from all over the state that showed up. And I, I, I was stunned. And after this 35-minute documentary, uh, they asked Jim Havey from Denver, an old buddy of mine who did the actual filming. I was a producer. Up on stage. And the idea being that they would lob a few questions to us. And when it came my turn, Somebody in the front row said, Jim, what do you hope happens as a result of this wonderful documentary? And I had to say something. I couldn't get tongue-tied. Tongue and I just spontaneously made this up. I hadn't thought about it. I said, well, it'd be great if the state of Wyoming were to adopt these 10 principles is the official code of the state. That's all I said. This guy jumps up from his chair. He said, I can get this done. I said, sir, I'm sorry. I don't know who you are. He said, my name is Jim Anderson. He said, I am president of the Senate. 
He's a Republican. And he sat down. Another guy jumps up and he said, Mr. Owen, I'll be the seconder. I said, sir, I'm sorry, I don't know who you are. He said, well, I'm Jim's counterpart in the house. I'll be the seconder. He sat down in the back of the room. Here's 300 people. This good looking cowgirl. I said, oh, my God. She, she, she said, Jim, you know me as a cowgirl. And I am. And she and her family were in this film. Her mom is like 80 years old and still pushes cows at the age of 80. And their, their family was in this little documentary. And she said, you know me as a cowgirl, and I am. I'm also a lawyer. I had no idea. And, and a member of the legislation. And she said, I'll be the third. And would you believe 40, 404, 40 days after that premiere in Laramie, I never met, met this guy in my life, Governor Frudenthaler or somebody, some name like that, signed a bill into law. His office called me up and said, Mr. Orton, would you care to come up to Cheyenne? I said, for what? He said, well, Governor Frudenthaler is going to sign some bill. I said, who? I never heard it. I didn't know him. He said, well, it's on that uh, two weeks. I go up there, so 40 days after this premiere, the governor signs a bill into law making this, again, this is, I don't think anybody's going to go to jail, but this is the, the whole idea is to inspire people to live up to these expectations. That's the whole idea. And what's fascinating to me is how come Wyoming is the only state that has a code? Why doesn't Nevada? Why doesn't, I live in Austin, Texas. How about Florida, California? The answer is, Nobody could agree in these states on anything. There's too, much, there's too much partisanship in Wyoming, as long as it's for the good of the state. Okay, enough about that. I, I want to quickly walk you through this. Live each day with courage. Now, each of these things has a nuance. This does not say be brave. It doesn't say be courageous. It says live each day with courage. As Robert knows, I live in Santa Barbara for, to, when we were raising our kids. Had a very, very dear friend. And he had fought cancer for seven years. And every time I saw, I saw Dick almost every day. He never once said, oh, please feel sorry for me. I couldn't believe his attitude every single time I saw him. Jim, how you doing? How you feeling? And I thought, that is courage. And of course, eventually, after seven years, he, you know, they, they, they put him to rest. But I thought, there's somebody that I can look up, up to and admire. Take pride in your work. One of the hallmarks of the cowboy and cowgirl is that they take terrific pride in humble jobs and i think what the young people today and i'm not some old geezer yakking about the young people but i think what they need to learn is if you don't take pride in the ordinary jobs you will never get a shot at being promoted to a bigger job it doesn't work that way so if you're waiting tables if you're sweeping floors you have to say to yourself I'm going to be the best dishwasher in Reno, Nevada. If you believe that and you work at that, believe me, somebody's going to say, I'm going to give you a job and give you some more money. It's, it's true. Always finish what you start. Cowboys hated quitters almost as much as they hated cowards. They wouldn't tolerate this. And so this is a real primary principle to a cowboy. Do what has to be done. We all know what that means. There's some times in life, there's just some, sometimes days, weeks, whatever, when things are going against you, and you have to be able to roll up your sleeves and say, whatever it takes, I'm going to get it done. If it takes staying up all night, if it means working overtime, you've got to get it done. Be tough, but fair. This particular one made a big difference in my life. 
whenever I got into a disagreement, which happens in every business, uh, I always said to somebody, I'm going to make you a promise. I promise you, I will not take advantage of you in this, in this disagreement. I promise. I want to hear your side of the story. If I hear your side of the story, would you agree to listen to my side? I want to meet you halfway. I cannot tell you how much uh, anguish that uh, disappeared because of that. When you make a promise, keep it. And this is not a movie. This, this cowboy handshake is for real. Ride for the brand. And that's why you all are here tonight. You're riding for the brand of the Republican Party of Northern Nevada. That's why you're here. And uh, talking about being cynical, once or twice a year I'll speak to some Wall Street people. And invariably, somebody will raise their hand and say, Mr. Owen, this ride for the brand sounds great. But what happens if the outfit doesn't reciprocate? It's simple. The cowboy takes his bedroll out of the truck wagon, hops on his pony, and rides down the trail to find another outfit. But as long as he collects a paycheck, no matter how meager it is, he gives his total in absolute loyalty to the outfit. My wife says, why would you say talk less and say more? Well, I aspire to this one. I don't I always live up to it. Remember that some things aren't for sale. And finally, know where to draw the line. And let's think about this idea of just for a second of shared values. Here we are with our country being, t being torn apart by deep and even bitter cultural and political divisions. Gay marriage, abortion, immigration, gun control. These are issues that often divide families, let alone communities. But is there anyone in this room who believes that we shouldn't live each day with courage? If so, I, I, would, I would like to have you raise your hand. I want to hear somebody say, Jim, it's okay to be a coward. We can't always be brave. That's, that's not realistic. Does anybody believe that's true? That you shouldn't strive to live every single day with courage. Well, how about whether well, a promise made shouldn't be a promise kept? Does anybody in this room think, you know, I know I made a promise. I know I gave you a handshake. I know a deal should be a deal. But, Jim, things change. Conditions change. You've got to be flexible. If not, you're going to get run over. Does anybody, does anybody think that's true? How about the idea that there are some things in this world that should never be for sale? How about reputation? Would you sell your name, your family, your reputation in the community? Would you? Well, I can tell you, I spent my entire career, 35 years on Wall Street. And the collapse in the financial markets that we all know about had zero to do with monetary policy or the economy, nothing. It all had to do with the fact that to, to an alarming and shocking degree, reputations were for sale, not for 10000 not for 100000 But It was like, how much money do you have? Do you have $10 million? But look back at what Bear Stearns did. Look back at what Goldman Sachs did, a great firm. Look what Lehman Brothers did. And you say, well, I thought they were supposed to put the client's interest first. Sure, until it hurt their pocketbook. The point is, there are some values we can all agree upon. 
despite our differences. And what's more, I'm convinced that these shared values can help to unite us and maybe even heal us at a time when our country feels so divided. When you think about it, this code of the West is a natural place to look for these shared values because it's part of the heritage we all share as Americans. I believe it's essential that we hold on to these values because heaven knows we need them today. Now, and I want to make this real, real clear. I'm not here to tell anyone what to believe. Cowboy Ethics is really a book about self-discovery. It provides a starting point, a jumping off place, and I hope the inspiration to help people look deep within themselves and decide what values and principles they want to live by. And let me say that having a clear sense of what you stand for and won't stand for can make a profound difference in how you choose to live your life. At first, you might think this book called Cowboy Ethics is a book about cowboys. Not really. It's a book about being a better person inside yourself. To be a better person inside yourself, you have to know who you are and what values define you. I want to pause for just a minute and give you all a chance to think about a personal value or principle that defines who you are. That was like for example, one I recently heard was keep it simple, keep it true. I like that a lot. Another one is don't wish it were easier, wish you were better. But my all-time favorite is one I heard from a rancher up in Pinedale, Wyoming. And she said, Mr. Orna, liked your speech, loved the book, but you left out a very, very important principle that every rancher lives by. I said, well, what's that? She said, well, Jim, my ranch has been in the family for 150 years. And she said, ranching is a really tough way to make a living, I can tell you. She said, I don't do it for me. I do it for my kids and my grandkids. And she said, my guiding principle is leave it better than you found it. And I thought, you know, if when you leave this earth, if they put down your gravestone, that wouldn't be too bad. He or she left it better than they found it. Does anybody here have a value or principle that you'd like to share? Now, this is not a contest. There's no prize. Uh, surely somebody in this room has a value or principle that they would like to share. Again, this, this is not a contest. Some anybody, yes, sir. Yes, Rob. So, uh, I don't. I'm third. First, God, others, then myself. Recently, though, I added a fourth first, God, others, and our president, and then myself. Wow, that's pretty good, Rob. <laughs> I want, I want one more, one more person. And it could be it could be your family. It doesn't need to be to be poly. I have learned in life, no matter what challenges you face, whether in life or in business or otherwise, you never give up and you never give in. Wow. <laughs> well, this brings yes, ma'am. Did you have one back there? Anybody else? Anybody? 
Well, this brings me to the third trait we all need. Yes, Very quickly, when I was raised in the country on a cotton farm, my papa always told me, if you can be bought, you can be sold. Oh. So make it, make oh, it good. Oh, I like that. Wow. I never, I never heard that. That is really, that's, that's strong. Anybody else? Well, this brings me to the third trait we all need if we want to stand tall, and that is grit. It's about having the guts and the heart to work hard at something and persevere. No matter how many times you fall down or how steep the climb. And this blend of qualities, which I've called grit, cowboys don't use that term. I know there's a book, book in a movie called True Grit. That was not written by a cowboy, believe me. Oh, it was a great, a great book, though. Cowboys use the word try, T-R-Y. Has anybody heard that term? Okay. To most of us, try is a verb. It means to make an attempt. The cowboys and cowgirls take that verb and turn it into a noun. And it's a noun invested with profound meaning. When cowboys say of someone, he's got try, they mean that cowboy gives 100% effort to whatever he's doing. And when they say, and this is reserved for very few people, that cowboy's got the try, T-H-E-T-R-Y. That's the highest praise a cowboy can give another cowboy. It means someone who always gives 110%. And like you said, never, ever quits. Do you all know who Ty Murray is? King of the Cowboys, the bull rider? Well, I live in Austin, Texas. And Ty lives in Stephenville, Texas. And Ty, I knew, was a big fan of cowboy ethics. He told some, a friend of mine. And I called Ty. I said, Ty, I want to come and talk to you. He said, sure, come on up to the ranch. And I got there. It was like a monsoon, and I had a sport coat on. I, he was there in a, I don't know, dressed in whatever, and he said, come on, we got a job to do. I said, what job? And he said, well, the fence and the stream got knocked over by the, by the rushing water. He said, we got to get this bob wire, called it fence, put back up. And he gave me a pair of leather gloves. He said, he said, Jim, stand right there, grab that sucker, and push. I said, my God, I could cut myself to myself. I said that. And here Ty gets down, pushes it up. He said, let's go back to the house. Took off his slicker. My jacket was ruined, of course. We sat in his living room for about an hour and a half. And there must have been, without exaggeration, he must have had 500 gold buckles under, the, under various glasses. Never once did he look at him. Not once. Never said, Jim, let me tell you about the Reno uh, rodeo. No, he just didn't even pay attention to him. And I said, Ty, there are lots of good athletes in your sport. What made you special? And he's real shy. In real, not on TV, but in, in real life, he's very shy. It's a very funny accent. He said, Jim, when I was a little kid, my mom said, Ty, you were born with an extra supply of try. And I got the biggest grin. I said, I just, a big grin. I said, what the heck does that mean? He wouldn't talk about it. Because these cowboys do not brag. That's bragging. No. Nope. He started talking about something else. I don't know what it was. After about 20 minutes of time, I want to know about try. What, what, what is that? I never heard that expression. He said, Jam, this is how he talks. He said, Jam, when I climbed down the bowl, he said, I couldn't guarantee you I was going to win a gold buckle. He said, I couldn't guarantee you I was going to last eight seconds. He got right in my face and poked me. 
I almost cried. It hurt so much. He said, by God, darn, guarantee you, I'm going to try my guts out. You know what I mean? Try my guts out. He talks this way. I said, I love this guy. So on the way back, it was still pouring rain. I, I, I had an idea for a book. And I said, I threw it out the window, so to speak. And I said, I'm going to write a book called The Try, dedicated to Ty Murray. And we use this with a lot of uh, students, middle school, high school students. And the whole idea being about the effort. If you want to get some, somebody some life, you got to put out the effort because nobody's going to give you the success that, you know, I think you probably deserve. Anyhow, try is one of those things that's hard to pin down, but you know it when you see it. It's what we love about star athletes. It's what makes the Navy SEALs so inspiring. It's that inner fire that says good isn't good enough. And I refuse to settle for being average. I'm going to be the very best I can be at whatever I put my sights upon, no matter what it takes. And isn't that what true success is all about? Being the very best you can be in whatever it is you choose to do with your life. And that phrase, what you really want to do in life, takes me to the fourth and final trait we all need to stand tall. And that is having a purpose. When I say purpose, I mean something different than a goal. We all have goals. Yours might be to finish your education, start your own business, become financially independent. Having a purpose is a bigger idea. It's how you choose to make your mark on the world. It's what gives your life meaning. It may also be how you want to be remembered. Research shows that people who have a strong sense of purpose not only live longer than those who don't, they also live with more joy and have a greater sense of satisfaction as they look back over the years. Some people are lucky. They develop a sense of purpose while they're still young, but it can take many, many years. That was certainly true for me. I feel blessed that more than a decade ago, I came up with the idea of cowboy ethics, wrote the book, and was inspired to start a foundation that, to spread the message that we can all be heroes in our own lives. To be a hero, you don't have to rescue someone from a burning building or find a cure for a life-threatening disease. You might be the single mom right here in Reno who's working two jobs, but always finds time to help with homework. You wonder, how does somebody do that? Or someone who puts a career on hold to care for an aging parent. Or the businesswoman who cuts her own salary to keep from laying off lawyer workers. These are what I call quiet heroes. If there's one thing this world needs more of, it's quiet heroes. My dad was a quiet hero. He wasn't rich or famous. He was a, a dentist in Lexington, Kentucky. That's where I grew up. A modest man, but a man with unshakable principles. The kind of man you'd like to have as a neighbor or friend. The kind of man I still aspire to be. The thing people still remember about my dad is whenever he walked into the room, people stood a little bit straighter. He had the kind of presence that made us all want to reach higher and call upon what was best in ourselves. I don't recall my dad 
ever once talking about ethics or values to my brother or myself. He didn't have to because he lived them, just like the cowboys and cowgirls who live by their code, the code of the West. Because of him, I realize how important it is to have role models and how fortunate I was to have a dad who was such a shining example of what it means to live a good life. Now that I'm older, I'm more and more aware that not everyone has been so fortunate. I've also realized if we truly want to change the world, we have to look to the next generation. And that's why I'm so passionate about working with young people. We do a lot of work with youth groups, boys and girls clubs, 4-H, FFA. We work at schools, high schools, middle schools around the country. And what you realize is the kids today, many, all too many of them grew up in households that don't have a mom and dad around the dining room table like a lot of us did. I want to urge everyone in, this, everyone in this room to get involved with the young people in your community. And this is one nonpartisan thing that we can all agree upon. Democrats, Republicans, we can all agree upon this. It's not a matter of giving money, it's a matter of giving time. And maybe you too can be that role model, that hero for some youngster who is struggling to find a path through life. Having just one person who sees that struggle and cares enough to get involved can make a huge difference to a child or teen who hasn't been as lucky as the kids in your family. As my dad showed me, the way to live a happier, more satisfied life is to reach for the very best in yourself and use the power you have to lift up others. If you can do that, then you too can stand tall and walk down the street with pride. Thank you all so much. I was really honored to be here. Thank you. If Jim would be so kind, if he would be so kind, we'll take some questions. But if you want to come up here, not commentary, questions, come up here so we can video it and live stream it. Jim, you can take a few questions. or All right, if you want questions, come up and ask. And then we'll do two drawings, one for the picture and one for the 50-50. Who wants to be the first one to ask Jim questions? I'll start out, explain more about the foundation. I read some about 40 schools, because we have some young people here, like Kaylee Conrad, that's Bill, our sure. IT person. Stand up, Kaylee, she's in junior in high school, she's still here somewhere. And Ryder Haig just is in college. We have some young people. Well, the whole school uh, effort, and we call this Be Somebody. It's Be Somebody Explanation. And the re reason for that name is I'm convinced that within, within each child, doesn't matter how troubled that child might be, down deep, there is a sense, I want to be somebody. And I think it's the obligation of schools and the society and folks like us who've been fortunate in life to do whatever we can do. It's not about of money of helping that child be the best he or she can be. And being the best doesn't mean being a partner at Goldman Sachs. It may, it may mean getting a job at Walmart. It may be, a, it may be go, becoming a carpenter, but whatever, whatever, you aspire to be, whatever your level of skills and talents, I think our society 
owes it to people who are less fortunate to know what we can do to help them. And that does not mean shower them with money or give away stuff. It's not that easy. So we, I've been doing this now for about eight years. It's the most satisfying thing that I do. It's wonderful to come and talk to the group here. But this is nothing like talking to a classroom of at-risk kids, the hardest kids to reach. And we started this in Denver, I guess eight years ago, with an amazing teacher named Ann Moore. There's a video that some of you all might want to watch uh, you know, in your spare time. And then, then it segued up to Casper, Wyoming. And what, I, and what I came up with was the idea that we should teach the teachers. So again, I'm not an educator. I go to schools occasionally. I provide the content, provide the books, but I'm not a teacher. I don't, I don't kid myself. But the teachers who can do this, and we, so the Boys and Girls Club out of Casper, Wyoming, has taught literally 500 teachers and group leaders, Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, FFA, you name it, they've done it. No, I don't. And so that's what this is all about. And it's an it's a extremely satisfying thing. Spe speaking of videos, that 35-minute documentary that you made, is that available on YouTube or anywhere else? Um, ask Bill, and we will get this to you in some fashion. I I've, I've got some. I'll be glad to get it to you. Who else wants to ask now, wait, a question? Wait, you, 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 may have to, have you, you may have to buy a book to get this for free, but that's a small price to pay. See, before my talk, the book was $20. It's now $40. That's, 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 that's the way it works. Where Okay. <laughs> Is there any other questions? I want to thank the RMC for hosting Jim Owens and allowing us to record this episode for Timelines. It was a very good episode. Cowboy Ethics. Really enjoyed it. Also want to thank our sponsors. My primary sponsor being Karen Conrad, a real estate broker in Reno, Tahoe. And also Podcasters Home. Don't forget to pick up your free podcasting course at podcastershome.com. Well, till next week, take care and we'll have another Timelines up for you. Oh, next week Timelines? I know what it's going to be. It's going to be WordCamp Orange County. Whoa, it's good. We'll have a review of it. Take care. Till then, enjoy.